where we, where we are going to go into the real estate we are talking about. Well, these developments come as the world today celebrates International Youth Day, a day set aside by the United Nations to highlight the importance of the actions of young people towards a great society. Now, each year, the observance of International Youth Day is marked with a theme relevant to the times. And the theme for 2020 this year is Youth Engagement for Global Action, a theme that has never been of more or greater significance um, as opposed to the current conditions. So let's have this conversation now with Vanya Kibu. She is a policy advocacy specialist with Youth Action, also working with AMREF. Vanya, many thanks for joining us here on Bottom Line Africa. The world today celebrates International Youth Day. If you've been listening to the, um, and the, the, the stories we've been running, um, you know, it, it, there's very little to celebrate really for the youth in these times. But what is the significance of the theme for this year? Um, thank you so much for having me. And I agree. Um, what is making the news now is not necessarily looks like um, not so much to celebrate. Um, but it brings us back to the conversation we started having um, three years ago on harnessing the demographic dividend. And the reason to celebrate is um, the fact that states are now paying attention to the change in the to the demographic change and they're realizing that if you don't invest if you don't um because harnessing your demographic dividend means that you need to invest um in the change in demography in a way that the economy can reap the best out of it mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. because you can have a demographic shift and then do nothing about it, and then you can have a crisis. And I think you've had uh, His Excellency the President before say that the youth bulge we have could either be a threat or a big opportunity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And COVID-19 has caused a lot of people to listen. It's interesting that we say it's a new normal. It's not a new normal. Young people were not always um, at the center of the conversation. COVID-19 has made it that a lot of um, disparities, um, especially affecting um, young people, adolescents, and women mm -hmm. have come to the fore. So in a way, it has forced us to think. Um, and so it, it was an opportune moment um, even for us to kind of look at what areas of investment do we need to focus on mm -hmm. for us to get the most benefits. Right. So when you look at the theme mm -hmm. um, for global action, I think there will, in my mind, it would be um, small efforts that come together that then make a, a, a bigger global impact. All right. first and, and, and I think, Vania, we, we all grew up in the age of youth, uh, the leaders of tomorrow, tomorrow. youth, uh, you know, the future. And many are saying now it's time to stop waiting for what the youth can do in the future and start involving the youth, you know, in policy making and advocacy as early as now. So this year's theme, Youth Engagement for Global Action, is again to highlight the ways in which engagement of young people at the local level, national level and global level can enrich Kenyans. But let's draw lessons from Kenya's, you know, situation alone. Um, in the last election, we elected very young people to represent the youth in parliament, in politics. What lessons can we draw from that representation? Um, so we did elect young people, which is, um, and it's kind of, a, it's, it's reflecting like the population as it exists, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the reason we actually, as Youth in Action, partnered with Kenyan parliamentarians was that the gap that we kept hearing as uh, youth in action was we aren't able as young people to bridge the gap of how to influence policy. And so you can have young people there and then have systems that don't serve the youth mm -hmm. or systems that don't serve the society as it, as it exists. Right. So creating a framework that has, um, that creates a direct source of accountability and responsibility for the lawmaking arm of the government to that it sets agendas influenced by young people and has young people participate in the communicating negotiation negotiations um and debating of policy issues mm -hmm. then that's the shift because we have a lot of young people involved in social economic uh, engagements um, and community projects and not to say that youth in action is the first organization to 
engage policymakers. There are many who we mobilization and movement building is a core part of working as young people and creating a change. Mm -hmm. But then creating a threshold for lawmaking was a gap, right? So that's that's the that's what we're looking to cure. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the fact that, uh, Vanya, we only have 10 years remaining to make the 2030 agenda a reality for all. But as we say that with COVID-19, we're staring at massive job losses. We have human rights violations, human trafficking, child labor, all dogging uh, the community as we speak. How can youth take matters into their own hands to ensure Vision 2030 is a reality mm -hmm. for them? Um, so there's certain ways, uh, there are certain levels. The first thing is um, that struck me and many of us who uh, <laughs> who work in this sector, I would say non-state actors, is the, um, I'm looking for the English word, the fact that accountability quickly left, it was the first um, um, aspect of governance that was out the window, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And this is what I mean. Decision making became very top heavy and not community engaging, right? So where resource, resources were applied, it was a reflection of the way governance exists at the moment, mm -hmm. right? So it wasn't in my mind, um, um, it wasn't, a, I would say, a deliberate action by the government to leave out young people, but the policy, the government structures as they exist because they already don't integrate aggressive community engagement, in, especially focusing on young people and mm -hmm. women, mm -hmm. then their voice was not there. Mm -hmm. So you find that the fissures or the gaps that already exist in, your, uh, in, in our approach to governance were then magnified. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes with um, economic and gender disparities. So right. our conversation would be to create policy frameworks that protect accountability, elevate it um, to a very high threshold of responsibility for policy making, mm -hmm. and then entrench it in how we operate even at a private company level. Mm -hmm. So that at the time when, um, because COVID-19 has shown us, bad days will come. So the question is who will suffer the most when your bad day comes? and who is protected. So if you have All a right. policy requirement that says when you're coming up with um, an appropriation bill for uh, emergency funds, you must consult that community, mm -hmm. even if it's a flood. They All must right. be... Uh, 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 Let's bring into the conversation Molo, Member of Parliament, uh, Kimani Kuria. Many thanks for your time and many thanks for joining the conversation. It is the International Youth Day. We're looking at how young uh, youth and young Kenyans as well can get into the um, you know, playground and uh, contribute to enriching national and multilateral institutions in the country. As a young Kenyan policymakers, what lessons have you drawn from your experience? Um, thank you very much for having me. Sorry, I joined in the little late. I had a meeting uh, this day, Bunge Day, so we had some uh, transactions to do at Parliament. Mm -hmm. And happy International Day to all the young people in the country and in the world. Uh, it's such a great day that we get to celebrate uh, young people. And most importantly, I'd like to say uh, when we mean by young people, we mean those below the age of 35. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the things that I, that I, that I, that I feel has not been celebrated enough or, or has, been, uh, has not been done well enough, is we have many people who uh, get appointments that were meant for youth because they are youthful. And so you find people uh, simply because they probably look young, uh, but you find them they're in their 50s, some of them even in their 60s, being appointed to positions that should have been uh, for the young people. Uh -huh. And also for this day, I have learned something as a young person that uh, we, if we wait for us to be given anything in this country or anywhere in the world, it will never happen. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, I've seen many young people wake up and go and grab uh, and compete for those, whether it's positions, uh, whether it's businesses, in whichever sector uh, that they want, uh, that, that they want to find themselves in. And, and I've also find them work very hard in a way that they even stand out. 
I don't even say even if you look at, for example, in your in your media houses, uh, we had people uh, that um, meant that were there, like the Casavulis, you know, all those um, uh, media personnel that were there, you know, uh, the generations older, and we found a breed of young people that if we, when we look at our screens almost all the time, we're seeing uh, fresh blood, we're seeing very young people. If you come to the face of politics, politics was known to be for the old people. Uh, but you find uh, we have almost 50 of us who are actually below 35 years of age. Mm -hmm. If you go to uh, CEOs of institutions, you've seen young people. And because these people have actually realized that uh, we're not waiting to be given, but we are going to forcefully uh, take those positions not because we are young people, but we are competent young people who mm -hmm. can serve well our country, in our media industry, in our corporate sector, in whichever other sector uh, right. that, that you choose. Right. Uh, and I mean, we're also talking about including young people and, you know, having their say in policy making and legislation. But when you take a look at, you know, the African context, you talk, a look at, uh, you talk about politics and trust. I mean, they, they cannot go in the same statement. But trust in public institutions, especially in Kenya, is eroding more so among the youth who make up the largest demogra demographic. But does enabling youth engagement in formal political mechanisms really increase fairness in these political processes? Um, uh, thank you very much for your question. You know, I, I'm one of the people that say if there's one population that is judged extremely harshly, whether it's by the media, whether it's the public, is young politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the political, uh, a political job is not necessarily a, a, a popular job uh, because unlike... Uh, you know, for example, when you went to work, you knew you're probably reading the, the 1 p.m. news, and after that, you probably read another news at 4 p.m. Whatever it is, the job description is extremely uh, uh, clear. Mm -hmm. But if in politics, uh, we expect politicians expected from one uh, legislation, whether you okay, the key functions of a member of parliament, for example, it will be legislation, representation, and, and, and oversight. But we're even expected to provide uh, solutions, whether short term or long term, to people's problems. Mm -hmm. So when people get hungry, it is their politician's problem. When the road is not fixed, uh, fixed it's the politician's problem. When the hospital is not working, it's not it's the politician's problem. And 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 and, and we, are, we have we have realized that we do not have all the solutions to those problems. Mm -hmm. And that's why, for example. Um, the, the project that we launched this week, we're beginning this engagement between, for example, Parliament and the young people, so that those ideas that can be brought into law that we can implement so that we find a lasting solutions to uh, youth problems then can be found. But to, the, to more directly answer your question, uh, yes, there has been eroding trust with politics, and it's not just in Kenya, it's everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. The politician is the most unpopular uh, person. Right. But more so when you are a young person. There are things that uh, you can do and you can get away with it, but if I do, and because I'm a politician, then I don't get away with it. Uh, uh, but even more so, and, and I find this extremely unfair, uh, sometimes you judge us against politicians that have been in parliament for 20 years. Mm -hmm. There's something learning curve. So definitely, by the time someone is doing his third term, is doing 15 years in politics, their knowledge of affairs, the, their way of doing business, would definitely, would definitely, or more arguably be a bit better because they're more experienced. Right. Some of us uh, are uh, and I mean, it, it's an interesting argument because I would say we needed fresh blood. They're not, you know, so deep-rooted into the system. But pause it there. Um, let me bring in Vania Kibush. She is with us here. She is a policy advocacy specialist. Vania, just hearing um, what, uh, you know, Honorable Kimani Kuria there says, it, sometimes his job description is very cut out. So we might say these young politicians are not delivering, but it's the system, like you say, that does not favor uh, you know the, 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 these young politicians to 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 um, to deliver so to speak so where do we bridge the gap Vanier, into ensuring that youth in politics youth in leadership positions can have their say in legislation and advocacy okay thank you um, yes and I would say one of the um, uh, results we got when we did a very brief inquiry before we came up with the framework was institutional capacity gaps within, I would say, the parliament, right? So it took a, it takes a while even, as uh, Honorable Kuria Kimani said, before you get into parliament, you're not really looking at what, what's my job going to be when I get there. It's, a, it's first about securing the seat. And you're just like, you're a reflection of what the society is like. So what this framework looks like, so one of them is um, uh, like a leadership engagement series. Um, and we have um, a youth parliament. And that's 
these are some are just a few interventions that are meant to demystify um, this <laughs> this house of lawmaking. Um, and also, the, we have um, like a political es like an essay contest from young people to support them to um, set the agenda. But to, but this is just the beginning where we want to work with other youth-led organizations and youth-serving organizations to create a, a roadmap that also works with the parliament to break down the bureaucracies of reaching, of having our views get to parliament. So that if it's a memo, let me even be able to just go on your website and have a comment section and type something. Or it is written by hand. Mm -hmm. Or it is a voice note. Because the... The, the, as I said, the way that parliament is set up <laughs> to listen, because young people is, is not um, reflecting young people. Because So some of the results we got also showed us that by the time young people were involved in a policy, in a bill, let's say, it was mostly towards the end um, and to kind of rubber stamp. And they would not know any, how far their proposals on the bill went. So there's no feedback loop of we propose, this is what we want as an allocation for reproductive healthcare, focusing on commodities, and this is how far it got. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So even the responsiveness of the, of, of the governance um, approach is not there. Mm -hmm. The other thing is creating a threshold, for instance, for, let's say you, the, the law requires two weeks right, notice of um, a public hearing being called by maybe, let's say, county government. That's not always the case. Sometimes they sent out their alert two days to, right? Mm -hmm. It has taken some youth organizations in some counties to boycott those hearings so that you, the, the, that county government cannot go there and say, oh, okay, this was a well heard issue. Right. And even if they say two weeks, what steps have you taken as the policy making institution mm -hmm. to make that document available in every language and in simple English or any other language that young people would want yeah. to understand, mm -hmm. even Braille, um, that would be available to young people as well mm -hmm. and to every member of the community? Have you used community radio? Right. Do, can we use um, KICD um, school um, studies right now to have blurbs on? what to expect when a law is coming into office. Right. A lot of young people who have, and there was a paper in the standard today, uh, there was an article in the, in the standard today about the frustrations that young people who eventually get into policy advocacy face right. because of the bureaucracies that exist. Because the other challenge that young people are facing is you don't even know after the policy is made or when it's being made, you don't know who the decision maker is. All right. So there's a All lot right. of investment you have to make because maybe you're talking to the um, youth coordinator.